comic weekly man, the jolly comic weekly man. And I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's comic weekly time. And here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness. Right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the Jolly Comic Weekly Man. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Well, little Miss Honey, how are you today? Oh, I'm just as happy as a lark. Well, you certainly are, and a beautiful lark, too. Thank you. I know a riddle today. Oh, tell it to me quick, 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 quick. What would you do if you were at sea and the ship sank? Hmm. What would I do if I were at sea and the ship sank? Uh-huh. Hey, I'd really be in trouble. What would I do? Oh, uh, just grab a bar of soap and wash yourself ashore. Oh, that's very good. Grab a bar <laughs> of soap and wash myself ashore. Yes. Now, just for that, will you read me the funnies? Puck the Comic Weekly? Very well, I will in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now, here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page, hop along, Cassidy. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Six guns blazing as he thunders along. Give us music for Hop Along. <laughs> Felipe, son of Don Ramon, had been captured by the bandits, Sloat and his gang. When they took him to their hideout at the old quarry, Felipe surprised them by pulling a gun on them. They'd thought Felipe was still blind from the sun. But unfortunately, Vane, the head of the gang, arrived suddenly and surprised Felipe. And once more... He's in the clutches of the outlaws. Sloat and his men have gone back to the Madeira ranch, leaving Vane to watch over Felipe. Vane binds Felipe's hands behind him, first picture, saying to Felipe, first picture, second row, you know where your father keeps the land grant to his property. Now, while we're waiting for Sloat and his companions to return, you're going to tell me where it is. Felipe replies, no, senor, this way you are forced to keep me alive. Vane leads Felipe over to the edge of a high cliff, saying, Am I? Take a look down there. An accidental fall from this height would cure your stubbornness forever. I'll give you five minutes to think it over. Meanwhile, back at the Madeira Ranch, Hoppy, California, and Lucky, with Don Ramon, are looking at a section of the property. Don Ramon had thought it was a swampy, useless piece of land. Hoppy has told him that it is oil, worth a fortune. Don Ramon exclaims, big picture, third row. You say this stuff is oil, Senor Cassidy? So that is why the raiders won my property. Hoppy replies, somebody smarter than those raiders is behind this, Don Ramon. There's no telling how much oil is here. The big job is to protect it. Suddenly, they're attacked by Sloat and his men. It's an ambush. California shouts, Get to the horses! Don Ramon says, He's too late, senores. They've cut us off from three sides. Hoppy says, First picture, fifth row. Retreat to cover through the oil pocket. It's our only escape route left. The men try to make their way through the bog. But suddenly, Lucky exclaims, Hey, I'm sinking, Hoppy! California says, Yes, so am I. This slimy ooze is drawing me under. First picks about him, Rose Sloat ceases fire, and seeing the men sinking in the oil, says, Ah, that's got him. That oil pool will swallow him up without a trace. Let's get back to the boss. They mount and gallop away. The last picture as Sloat and his henchmen gallop triumphantly off, the victims sink slowly into the bottomless ooze. Oh, how will Hoppy ever escape now if they're sinking down? Look, they're way up to their shoulders. Yes, they're really in danger. Why, that's as bad as quicksand. It pulls you right down. Yes, I've heard about that. You just can't get yourself out. Now, only a miracle can save them now. Oh. I'll certainly hope for one. So will I. Now? Now, please read me Prince Valiant. Very well. Over the page we go. 
And there he is on page three. And I'm very much worried because last week Val was making a trip over the mountains and it became very cold. And then that boy Arf's feet were frozen. Yes, and there are no doctors up there to take care of Arf, so Val is very concerned. Well, read and let's see what's going to happen. Very well, here we go with Prince Valiant in the days of King Arthur. Eckert, Breckett, Gray, Malkin, and Quince. Music romantic for a fair, fair prince. <laughs> At the first thin light of dawn, Paul arouses Prince Valiant and his friends. They shake the snow from their cloaks. There's no time to lose. At first, the descent is slow, for the new fallen snow is slippery and the way perilous. Finally, last picture top row, they reach a spot late in the day below the clouds and snow. Here, there's grass for their horses, and here they can camp. So they pasture the horses and dry out their clothing by the warm campfire. First picture, next row, Val and Paul examine Arf's frozen feet. The boy is in agony, his feet swollen and discovered. Val realizes that Arf needs the help of a doctor. Next day, they come to the valley of the Baltia. The road becomes easier and Arf can ride. And then finally, last picture of the row, they come to the town of Aosta. A welcome haven to those who have crossed the Alps by either Great St. Bernard or Petit St. Bernard Pass. And they are directed to a doctor. The doctor examines and dresses Arf's feet. And then first picture bottom row whispers to Val, Take him swiftly to the hospice at Torino, for it will take greater skill than mine to save his life. So they journey to the town of Torino, where Hannibal rested his army after crossing the Alps long years ago. Arf is carried into the hospice, and the doctor is summoned. The doctor examines Arf's feet carefully, and then last picture, Val is told the verdict. His heart sinks when he hears it. The lad may live, but if he does, it will be many months ere he can travel. For many months, what will they do? No wonder Val's heart sinks. Because he wants Arf to go along with him. And at the same time, Val's on an important quest for his father and must go on. Well, uh, maybe what he'll do is uh, to leave Arf with the doctor and go on to where he's going and uh, uh, then pick Arf up on his way back. Hey, maybe that's what he will do. We'll find that out next week. I'm glad, though, that Arf's in the hands of a good doctor because he'll be all right now. Yes. Now, how would you like to see what Flash Gordon's doing? Oh, I'm very anxious to find out because Flash is on the moon. Do you remember? Yes. And uh, last week he captured that beast. Beetle man, which is uh, an animal that looks like a beetle, but it's as big as a man. Mm-hmm. And the beetle man seemed to be grateful that Flash didn't shoot him. Well, Flash is trying to find the place where the meteors are being fired from. Those are the big shooting stars that were exploding on the Earth. Yes. Well, let's read and see where the beetle man leads Flash to. I hope it's to where the meteors are coming from. Very well, here we go with Flash Gordon. Rega, rega, doon, doon, saskamatash. Let's have music for heroic Flash. <laughs> With a captive beetle man, Flash explores the moon crater from which are launched the meteors that have been bombarding the Earth. Dale tells Flash that she thinks the moon man wants them to hurry. He seems to be afraid it's time for another meteor to be fired. The beetle man leads Flash to the edge of a tube which is sticking up through the ground. At last picture top row, Flash looks down and sees a hollow tube like a giant cannon sunk in the moon's crust. In it, a crew of beetle men is readying the next shot. Flash says, Ah, looks as if they use an atom blast from the bottom of this tube, possibly with booster shots to help it pick up, locking their tunnels behind them. And the captive beetle men Then the workers vanish, locking their tunnels behind them. And the captive beetle men And the captive beetle men And the captive beetle men warns Flash, and they scramble for ship. A series of terrific explosions. <laughs> Quickly, Flash and Professor Bright fetch atom weapons from their rocket ship. Flash tells Dale, if Flash tells Dale, yeah, we'll spike their space cannon. That'll give the Earth a breathing spell until we can make sure the moon men won't build another tube. With the assistance of Dale and Professor Bright, 
flash pictures of atomic rockets in the tube from which the Beetleman has fired their meteors. When the charges are in place, and flash touches off a series of tremendous atom blasts that fill the launching crater with radioactive ants. Not if this is the only tube from which they've been shooting their meteors. Well, what'll happen to Flash and his friends if all those beetle men come after them? Well, that's a question that I can't answer. They'll be angry now. Flash said so. Yes, perhaps they will be. And we'll look forward to next week to Flash and the beetle men. Ooh, that'll be exciting. Mm hmm Well, now, though... Oh, now it's time for Dagwood and Blondie. And here they are on the first page of the second section of Puck the Comic Weekly. And here we go with Dagwood and Blondie. But I'm a food, I'm a fum, zim, zam, zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. Dagwood is downtown shopping with Blondie. He's loaded down with packages, and he says to Blondie, All right, we got everything. Let's go home now. I'm tired. Blondie replies, Okay, dear, I'm ready. As Dagwood starts to walk down the street, Blondie says, Uh oh, here comes Mrs. Smidley. Dagwood says, Come quick, that gossip will talk our ears off. Dagwood and Blondie start down the street. Last picture, top row, there's a... Yoo-hoo! Blondie! Blondie says... Oh, it's too late. She saw us. <laughs> well, Dagwood stands by as the two women start to gossip. No, I heard Mrs. McNuff. Now, Dagwood's arms are very tired from the packages he's holding. And then suddenly he notices he's sinking down through the sidewalk. He looks down, and he sees he's on a freight elevator that's lowering him into the basement of a building that he was standing in front of. Last picture of the row, the elevator stops. Dagwood turns, takes one step, and his feet shoot out from under him. The packages scatter all over. And Dagwood is bumped along a conveyor belt and then dumped on the floor, first picture, next row. A man yells. I stop it. Then she had a bell ring him on the elevator lowered. Dagwood's so furious he leaps to his feet and jumps at the guy saying, I'll shoot! Meanwhile, last picture of the row, Blondie and Mrs. Snibley are still talking, so interested in their gossip they haven't missed Dagwood or heard the fight. As Blondie and Mrs. Snibley stand there chattering, the elevator begins to rise again. And first picture, bottom row, Dagwood's head and the top of his hat appear through the hole in the sidewalk. Then Dagwood appears with one eye black, his face covered with bruises, and his arms full of packages again. The elevator pushes Dagwood up until he stands beside Blondie, who doesn't even notice him when Mrs. Nibley waves goodbye. And Blondie says, Bye-bye, Mrs. Nibley. Come, Dagwood, let's go. Dagwood marches toward home without saying a word, and Blondie comes along behind him. I must say you weren't very polite. You never spoke a word to her. And Dagwood's so mad he feels just like this. <laughs> Funny. <laughs> Blondie didn't even notice that Dagwood went down into the basement or that he's all beaten up. No, I'll bet Dagwood will have a hard time explaining that to her. <laughs> That'd be pretty hard for anyone to understand. Oh, look, here's Roy Rogers right below Dagwood and Blondie. Yes, and I'll read that in just a moment. But first, here's that nice man with something interesting to say. Now, here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page of the second section, right at the bottom, Roy Rogers, King of the Cowboys. Magic words for the music, please. A yip by yo Now, here we go with Roy and Trigger. A yip by yo <laughs> Stogie Grimes, the outlaw, had escaped from Roy. Roy joined Wildwood O'Dowd and Doleful Hawkins, his friends, at Cedar Valley again. Wildwood has with her Blackjack, the wonderful lead steer, who is as almost intelligent as a man. As they're talking, they see coming toward them a herd of cattle that are stampeding, running away. Out in front is Glib Mason. The cattle gallop straight at them, and just as it seems that they'll be trampled by the runaway herd, Roy shouts to Wildwood, Hey! Let Blackjack loose, Wildwood! Here's your chance to put that lead steer to work! Wildwood turns Blackjack loose, tells him to run out and slow the runaway cattle down. Blackjack gallops out in front. Roy and Dolfo close in on the edge of the herd, heading them into the canyon. Roy yells, 
Pedro Mason's over yonder. If we can get a milling down there, we might stop this stampede. Black Jack leads the cattle into the canyon. They keep the cattle moving in a circle until finally the cattle calm down. First picture bottom row, Wildwood, who is very pleased, says proudly that it was Black Jack, her steer, that stomped the stampede. Doleful says, first picture bottom row, yeah, but I got a feeling a lot worse is gonna happen before those critters get to the folks rawhide. Raw says, well, hey, what happened to that fellow Mason, huh? Wildwood can watch the herd. Let's find him. So they go looking for Glib Mason, who was riding at the head of the stampede. Roy says, you sure we can trust that smooth token promoter? Doleful answers, all I know is that when rawhide ranchers lost their cattle in a storm, Mason collected money for a trail drive to bring in more stock. Oh, there he is, Roy. They see Mason sitting on a rock, mopping his brow. <laughs> Meanwhile, back at Pinto Basin, as Wildwood watches the cattle, a stranger rides up with a blanket across his face. He says, Ah, senorita, I have a message from Roy Rogers. Muy importante. And then he says to himself, Hope she don't recognize me. I gotta grab her in that lead steer. Last picture, he suddenly throws the blanket over Wildwood's head, claps his hand over her mouth so she can't make a sound. It's Stogie Grimes who says, You quit wiggling, you wild cat. You're taking a ride with Stogie Grimes. Oh, that's the outlaw that escaped from Roy last week, you remember? Yes, it is. I didn't think we would see him so soon. No, neither did I. I'll bet you that he's connected with the, the running away of those cattle. I'm sure he is. Well, I, I hope he doesn't get away with that wonderful steer blackjack. You know, he tried to get in before. Yes, I know. My, I hope Roy gets back in time. Well, that's something we'll have to wait for until next week. But we won't have to wait till next week to read Uncle Remus. Oh, yes, please do, because he's my favorite. Very well, then, let's turn over the page. And there on page three is Uncle Remus and his tales of Br'er Rabbit. Say the magic words with me. Hippity hoppity, make, make it a, it a habit, habit to give, give us music for old Br'er Rabbit. rabbit. <laughs> Uncle Remus says, This is the tale about how Brer Bar slipped up on his ignorance and lost his hiding place. Little Brer King B has come to Brer Rabbit for help, and he's telling him, Yes, sir, Brer Bar is stealing our honey, and he hides it somewhere so I can't find it. Brer Rabbit, who has made a funny little box, points to it, saying, Well, maybe this box can find the hiding place, Brer King B. Now, you go tell all the other little bumblebees to do just like I am, and then I'll do the rest. And Brer King Bee says, I'll tell him, Brer Rabbit. And he flies away. A little later, Brer Rabbit, with a box in his hand, is visiting Brer Bar and showing the box to him. Brer Bar looks at it and says, Damn, you says that is your box of good luck. And Brer Rabbit replies, Yeah, tells me where I can find good luck. And last picture of the row, Brer Rabbit says, Yeah, watch the box me, Brer Bar, while I goes in here and finds a gold mine. Brer Bar says, Duh, yeah, go ahead. I'll watch it. As soon as Brer, Bar is, or Brer Rabbit has disappeared into the bushes, Brer Bar looks at the box, first picture bottom row, and says greedily, Duh, a box of good luck. And he looks up, and he looks down. Looks back and looks front and then picks up the box and runs away with it. <laughs> Bro Rabbit, who has watched all this from behind a bush, giggles. Hee, <laughs> Bro Bar, I think I found something what proves that box is good luck. A little later, we're with Bro Bar, who is going into a cave saying, I'll just get into my hiding place and see what's inside the box. Well, inside the cave are barrels and pails and buckets full of honey, which he's stolen from the bees. And Brer Bar opens Brer Rabbit's mysterious box. And the bees swarm out. And Brer Bar screeches, oh, hey, This ain't luck, this bees. And as the stinger bees tear after him, Brer Bar dashes out of the cave. 
And the queen bee says, Oh, here's all our honey. And the princess bee says, Yes, I'll skin tote it back. And the king bee says, Yes, and fill up Broke Rabbit's box of good luck. And Uncle Remus says, When greed gets into your eye, you can go blind. Oh, wasn't that a clever scheme of Br'er Rabbit? Yes, he just knew that Br'er Bar would be so greedy that he would try to steal Br'er Rabbit's box. Yes, and when he did, he took the box and took it to the place where Br'er Rabbit was sure that he'd have the honey hidden. Ah, <laughs> he's a clever one. And now the bees will get their honey, and Br'er Rabbit will get some, too. I wish I could have some, too, because I just love honey. Yes, that's what you got your name, isn't it? <laughs> yes, I guess it is. <laughs> well, let's finish <laughs> reading the funnies so we can go and get some honey. All right. Read me the Dick's Adventures, please. It's on the very last page, isn't it? Yes, it is. So here we go to the very last page and Dick's Adventures. Say the magic words with me. riggedy pack a zack a zick Let's have, have music, music for Adventurous Dick. Dick. Exciting, wonderful things have happened to Dick in his adventures. He's been with John Paul Jones, one of the most famous sea captains of the early days of America. But something has happened. Dick suddenly finds himself dressed like a soldier, carrying a musket. He's standing by a road watching some soldiers pass by, and he says to himself, hey, I guess I'm still dreaming. I was just with John Paul Jones in the terrific battle between the Bonhomie Richard and the British Serapis. Gosh, I better catch up with those other guys. Well, he catches up with the soldiers and asks them who they are. And one of them answers, Oh, I'm John Haynes, gunner, 7th Pennsylvania Regiment. Haven't seen you before, Corporal. Dick tells him who he is and then asks, Well, where are we headed for, Sergeant? Last picture, top row, Hayes answers, Valley Forge, Corporal. He notices Dick's dismay and adds, Hey, cheer up. I hear it's the right cozy nook to spend the winter. Well, Dick goes along with him to Valley Forge. They turn the bend, and there it is in front of them, first picture next row. Cold, a camp of bleakness, flimsy wood huts. The men of Washington's Continental Army, hungry, ill-clad. Dick thinks bitterly, Well, they can't call us summer soldiers. But what warms Dick and his ragged companions in arms to the boiling point is the knowledge that while they hunger and freeze, the King's Redcoats are snugly occupying the captured city of Philadelphia. To Dick's surprise, he finds the Marquis de Lafayette and Baron von Steuben sharing the miseries of Valley Forge with Washington and his men. Last picture of the row, Baron von Steuben growls, oh, You Americans have courage, but no discipline. How can you beat the British who have both? So General Washington details Baron von Steuben to train the American soldiers. First picture, bottom row, each day and all day comes snow, sleet, hunger, or fatigue. The undisciplined continental soldiers take orders from the harshest drill master of Europe. And day by day, as the winter wears into spring, the freebooting Indian style Americans are made into a tough, compact army. Baron von Steuben approves. Now we are nearly ready. Only one man is really happy at Valley Forge. It's Sergeant Hayes, the man Dick met on the road. Last picture, he smiles at Dick as he says, I'm writing to my darling wife, Molly, to visit us. And Dick wonders, Molly? Molly Pitcher? <laughs> Picture. Oh, she's a woman who was famous in revolutionary days. Famous for what? Ah, I'm not going to spoil the surprise by telling you. All right, I'll wait to find out. But uh, didn't those soldiers have a hard time training in the cold and snow? Look, some of them don't even have any stockings on. Yes, they were brave men, and we must never forget how much we owe those men. Because this is really true what you read here. Poorly clothed and without good food... And with none of the comforts that we have today, those men trained and fought to make this a free country. I'm going to take this to school and show my teacher because she's talked about how those men made freedom for us. I think that's a wonderful idea. And we'll find out more about them next week. Now? Oh, now it's time for Rusty Rally. And this is really exciting because you remember last week that man named Smith locked Rusty and Tex up in the truck and then drove the truck away. And don't forget that the secret plans that he's stolen and had hidden in the picture slipped out and he doesn't know yes, it. Yes, he just has the picture, but Rusty has the plans. 
But then he's given him to Tex. Yes, and so now let's read and see what happens next with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. <laughs> Locked up in the truck, Rusty says, Hey, golly, Tex, Smith must be an enemy spy if he stole these secret plans. What do you suppose he'll do with us? Tex replies, Hey, keep your voice down, Rusty. He thinks those plans are still in the back of that picture frame. Hey, sounds like he's driving over a wooden bridge. Eh, hey, stopped. Can you make out where we are, Rusty? Rusty peeks out a little window in the truck and says, Well, it looks like a lumber camp or a sawmill. At this moment, Smith gets out of the truck, last picture top row, and says, Now listen, Tex and Rusty, this is as far as we go. Just don't try any tricks and you won't get hurt. And I'll be back in a minute and unlock the door. And Smith goes to the old wooden bridge, first picture bottom row, pours some gasoline on it, saying, This old sawmill has only one road to it, and that's over this bridge. With the creek so high, all I gotta do is to destroy it, and they'll be trapped long enough for me to get clear away. Then he goes back to the truck, saying, All right, now... I'm going to unlock the van. You stay where you are till I say okay. And remember, I still have your shotgun. He unlocks the truck and then crosses the bridge to the other side and sets it on fire so Rusty and Tex can't go after him. Meanwhile, inside the truck, Tex says, Oh, don't take any chances, Rusty. Wait till he gives us the word. A moment later, Rusty hears... Okay, come on now. Rusty says... Now he yelled okay. Come on, Tex. Rusty and Tex open the van door and step out. In last picture, see the bridge ablaze. Tex says, suffering catfish. That loco hombre has set fire to the bridge. And Rusty exclaims, oh, golly, we can never get the van back to the road now. <laughs> The joke is really on that Smith because Rusty has a secret plan. Yes, and if Smith wants to get the plans back, he may find that since he's burned the bridge down, he's fooled himself because he won't be able to get back to Rusty to get them. Oh, yes. Do you know, sometimes those things can work both ways, can't they? Yes, you bet they can. And we'll find out more about this next week. Now, that's all the time I have. But before I go, here's that nice man with some more interesting information. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I gotta go now. All right, Mr. Comic Weekly Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date, and a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man. The Jolly Comic Weekly Man.